and bring those who lost, Heavenly Father. Father God, we just ask you to just continue to be with us, be with the speaker of the hour, and may we just open up our hearts and our minds so we, so we can receive the word, if it's your will, Heavenly Father. Father God, like always, we just love you and appreciate everything you have done for us, everything you're doing, and everything you plan to do in our future, because only you know, Father God. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, let's all say amen. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It is good to be again in the house of the Lord on tonight. We're certainly grateful for this gift called life. Anybody grateful for the gift called life? Uh, are you alive? Has God blessed you? Do you feel like you're blessed? And we just need to be reminded of the goodness of God and how truly good the Lord has been. Many people have had to answer the call of death since the last time we met together, but God saw fit to bring us together again on tonight. And I just want to remind you to take all of these precious moments and don't take them and honor God. Don't take it for granted that you got a chance to praise God. Like just having a chance to praise God is a blessing. I want to try that again. Just having an opportunity to praise him. There's some people that's locked up and just they can't they don't have what we have. And God has given us the freedoms to have all of these wonderful blessings. And we want God to know that we are very appreciative. So at this time, beloved, we're going to jump right into our Bible study on tonight. We certainly want to let you know, feel free to ask any questions. We have some very powerful principles we'd like to share with you tonight from God's holy and divine word. First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16. I want to thank all of you who thought it not a robbery to be here tonight. And we certainly want to just bless your life tonight. God has been good to add to our number on this Sunday. Amen, somebody. We'll tell you more about that shortly. And we're just grateful for your presence tonight. I hope that you have come with an expectation that when you read the word of God, he's going to bless you. First Samuel 16, verse 1. Share this on your mobile devices. Please be in prayer for um, several of our members. Um, we were just alerted that, um, was it her daughter? Sister um, Edie Lachey was in an accident and she's headed to the hospital now. So um, uh, that's the, the only word that I know, but um, uh, her mother was calm when she called my wife. So let's pray for her and certainly let's be in prayer for brother uh, Tyran Baker had a successful surgery on today. Can we give God glory for that? Amen. Amen. Brother Baker, you would remember would usually be doing our opening prayer. So we're grateful to God for that. And we're going to pray for Edie Lachey's speedy recovery. For the last several months, we have been in a series called A Reason for My Hope so that we can give you a reason for why you believe in what you believe and not just a emotional answer. We want you to be able to give an articulate, coherent answer or response or defense for what you believe. Let's go over a couple principles that we can learn from 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. There you'll find these words. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among. We want to give you the first principle. These are very important for your life. These are life biblical principles that are true everywhere for believers. First principle I want to give you is follow the clear commandments God gives you. Follow the clear commandments 
that God gives you. And has anybody in this place ever suffered from disappointment? I want you to know that the best thing that you could do to overcome disappointment is to follow the clear commandments that the Lord gives you. Can we say that together? Follow the clear commandments that the Lord gives you. Again, follow the clear commandments that the, again, on your own. Again. Samuel was hurt. He was disappointed. And God had rejected all of his efforts through uh, working with Saul. I want you to know that when you, as a child of God, follow the clear commandments that God gives you, God will send you on a journey from what he rejected so that you can travel to what God has selected. Let me repeat that. When you follow the clear commandments of the Lord that he gives you, God will send you on a journey from what God rejected to what God has selected. That way you don't get so messed up when you get disappointed and disenfranchised over what God has rejected. People of faith must know that when God says no, he's saying no for a reason. And God's no is better than our yes. Because God's no tells us that he has something else planned for us. Come on, somebody. In the future. Notice your Bible. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long dealing with time? How long will you grieve over Saul? Watch this. Since I have rejected him from what? Being king over Israel. Now notice what he told him. Notice what he told him here. Still in, still in the C clause of verse number one. He says, fill your horn with oil and go. Oh, beloved, did you see the clear commandment of the Lord? Remember I told you, follow the clear commandments that the Lord does what? Gives you. Follow the clear commandments that the Lord gives you. So instead of being so disappointed over what God has rejected, focus on the clear commandments that God gives you so that you can eventually get to what God has selected. You're so worried about what God rejected, focus on his commandments so that God could get you to what he has what? Selected. Now this is important. He says, fill your horn with oil and go. When he says fill your horn, He's talking about anointing the next king of Israel. A horn would certainly come from an animal. And what God wanted uh, Samuel to do was to follow his clear commandments, because if he were to put the oil in his horn and go, then he can get on the way to appointing God's next king. That is very important. How many of you could take this principle and say, I spent too much time worried about what God had rejected for my life. And I spent too much time wasting and waiting when I could have just followed God's clear commandments and been closer to my destiny than sitting there and soaking in my reality. And I'm telling you right now, that if you can, first of all, understand the first principle, this will bless your life. Because many of you say, well, what, what should I do? Well, don't be depressed. Because remember, God doesn't see as man sees. See, we see to the hill, God sees over the hill. We see to the corner, God sees around the corner. We see what's in front of us today, God sees tomorrow. So I'm telling us what we need to do, if you ever got disappointed, what you should do is find a clear commandment that God has given you and follow it. Number two, principle number two, you possess something of value that other people will appreciate. So to write that down, it's going to bless your life. I'm taking a principle from what we can learn here. You, my, my friends, you, my sister, my brother, you possess something of value 
that other people will appreciate. Now, notice what the instruction was in the C clause of verse one. He says, fill your horn with oil and go. Can we say that together? Fill your horn with. OK, 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 let's stop, stop, stop right there. OK, I need a little more energy tonight. I'm just going to ask you for it. I just just need a little more energy tonight, a little bit more smiling. Um, let's say it together. Feel your. One more time. Well, Brother Jones, I got my heart broke. Brother Jones, I just got fired. Brother Jones, somebody didn't speak to me on Sunday at church. Brother Jones, it looked like they talking about me at church. Listen, listen, listen to me. Follow the clear commandments. Because the moment you start following the clear commandments God gives you, guess what? You're going to be closer to your destination. Are y'all with me on tonight? So notice what he says. Fill your horn with oil and go. Notice what he said he's going to do. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. I'm telling you that if someone does not show appreciation for the value that you have, there will be somebody in your future that does. See, listen, anytime you get disappointed, just know if you get disappointed, don't take it personal necessarily. If someone rejects part of the work that you've done, you still possess something that will help you be productive in the future. Because Samuel was a prophet. Samuel was a judge. And guess what he still had? A horn. Somebody shout a horn. He still had a horn. What's the principle I'm trying to get the church to see that you still possess something of value that if you just follow God's instructions and use it, God will lead you to your next destination and your destiny. Does anybody know what I'm talking about on tonight? So instead of soaking and being disappointed, all he had to do was feel. Feel his horn with oil because God is getting ready to do what I call. Uh, the first oil change in the Bible. Uh, somebody shout oil change. God was getting ready to anoint the next king of Israel because God always has a plan. I'm going to give you my third principle and we're going to move on here and hopefully we can get you out of here in a decent time to enjoy some of this sun. The third principle I, I want to share with you is God is a promise keeper. Can we say that together? God is a, just for the folks who believe it, God. So the first principle I wanted you to see was we have to follow the clear commandments that the Lord gives you. Number two is realizing you possess something of value that someone else will appreciate. Saul did not appreciate being anointed with oil and what Samuel did for him. But God was getting ready to send Samuel to somebody else named David who would appreciate him. So I'm telling you, just because someone doesn't appreciate you doesn't relinquish the value that you have. I wish I had somebody in here because everybody won't see the value of your efforts. Watch this. I know that's right because they didn't even see that God had some value in their lives. Because God wanted to be their king. And what happened? They rejected God as being their king and said, we want a man-made king. Watch this. Just so we can be like everybody else in the world. So the principle is, is that if folk don't appreciate the value God provides, well, you know, some people are going to miss the value that you provide. But don't you worry about it. You just feel your. And follow the clear commandments of the Lord, because if you fill your horn with oil and go and follow God's clear commandments, God is going to send you to your destiny. And the, the church of Christ got to believe that we can do more. We don't have to believe in this sad, poor, welfare minded kind of Christianity. I don't believe in the welfare minded Christianity. I believe that God wants to do more. How God is going to be your God and your king and you don't believe you can have more. 
You don't believe you can do more. You don't believe you can have more. You don't believe that God can take you to better places and higher levels. Anybody believe God wants to take us higher? Anybody willing to follow the clear commandments of the Lord and realize that you possess something of value? You possess something in value. And if the, this man right here don't see it, God, God will send you to somebody who does. Because there will always be people that will not be able to uh, remove the blinders from the value that you provide. So Samuel was in a depression. But notice what the text says. Fill your horn with oil um, and go. I want you to understand this. He says, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Somebody shout Jesse. Notice what the text says. For I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Now, if you know anything, of the, so my third principle is God is a, half of you got it. One more time. God is a, one more time, church. Now, you just prophesied to your own self when you said that. Because if you truly believe that what you said out of your mouth is true, then that means whatever promise that God has given, he will keep it. Church, I am telling you, uh, beloved, that the God that we serve is indeed a promise keeper. Now, let me tell you where I got that from. I got that from the C clause of the text. When it says, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now, you got to know something about Jesse to understand that God is a promise keeper. Don't have time, uh, but let's, let's just quickly go here. I, I can't teach it all out tonight. But Genesis 12, verse 3, uh, Brother Randall, Genesis 12, uh, verse number 3. I got to show you that God made a promise to a descendant of Jesse that God kept. And the reason why God kept it is because God had a bigger picture in mind for the family of Abraham. Notice what he said in verse number three, beloved. God says to Abram, he says, and I will bless those who. Mm, um, it, uh, what's the principle there? It pays to be a blessing. Who have you blessed recently? He's going to bless those who bless you. If you are blessed, a one who blesses somebody, don't have time. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. Abram and any uh, you all, the families uh, of the earth will be what? So God made a promise to a man by the name of that we know of, of Abraham, when God changed his name. What is Ab Abraham? Abraham is the father of. Of many nations. Now, when God made a promise to Abram, uh, we're talking about a God who allowed Abraham to have a baby when he was 100. And Sarai had a baby when she was 90, which tells us that God has the ability to do something for you in a season where most people would never believe it could happen. I don't know if you heard what I just said, that God has the ability to do something for those who have faith in a season where most people wouldn't believe that it would happen. Most 90 year olds are in nursing homes, not nursing a baby. So to say amen when you can. But for Sarah, God did something different with her because Abraham believed in the promises of God. Now, sister, don't you try that now. I don't want to even get on that tonight. So I'm simply saying that God made a promise to Abraham in his old age that God would bless him. Um, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, you know what it, the text says, and all, if you just look up at the sky, look up at the stars, how many you can count will be your descendants. So it, obviously there was, it was innumerable for Abraham, but Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob. You know the story. What are you doing, Brother Jones? I'm tracing the lineage of Abraham 
all the way down to Jesse to show you that if God told Abraham, uh, the, the first person that he told 14 generations later, now we come down to David. Why, why are you sending Samuel to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite? Because God is a promise keeper. And if you made a promise to Abraham years and years ago, God will keep his promise. So, you know, the whole story, I can go all the way down through it. Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac and Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons was Judah. Judah get, gets caught sleeping with a woman named Tamar who was posing as a prostitute. They have twins, Perez and Zerah. God uses Perez, and Perez has a son by the name of Ezron. Ezron has a son by the name of Ram. Ram has a son by the name of Abinadab. Abinadab has a son by the name of Nashon. Nashon has a son by the name of Salmon. And with Salmon, it starts getting interesting. Because you re remember, Salmon was the one uh, that ended up marrying, come on somebody, or Rahab. Uh, yeah, it started getting a little funny with uh, Salmon because Salmon married Rahab, uh, who owned a brothel. OK, I'm just trying to be discreet as I can. But yeah, a sister girl got out. She was a little out there, y'all. They had a baby by the name of Boaz. Somebody shout Boaz. Boaz was a rich wealthy farmer who married a woman by the name of Ruth, who was a Moabite woman in the days of the judges. They have a son by the name of Obed. Somebody shout Obed. Obed was the child that blessed Naomi, his grandmother, uh, in his infancy, newborn stages. Obed grows up, has a son by the name of Jesse. Are you following that God is a promise keeper? And in the promise that God promised, it's not just tracing the lineage. It is to know what God told Abraham and what was going to happen. See, Abraham was a man of faith. And what God was doing, watch this. Oh, God. God was preaching the gospel to Abraham long before God revealed the gospel. He was preaching the gospel, showing Abraham as a as a example that watch this God would justify the Jews and the Gentiles by faith because God credited Abraham with righteousness everybody shout righteousness not on the basis of him earning righteousness but on the basis of him having faith in what God said. So God credited, somebody shall credit it. He credited Abraham with righteousness on the basis of Abraham's faith. Paul picks up his powerful pen and writes to the churches of Galatia in Galatians chapter uh, three and verse number eight. And Paul says that God was preaching the gospel to Abraham, signifying that God would not only justify the Jews by faith, he would also justify the Gentiles by faith. And I don't know if you know when to get happy. It is to know that God justifies us by faith and not on the basis of our perfection. We are acquitted and God dropped the charges, not on the basis of how good we've been, but on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ. Look at your Bible. Thank you, audiovisual team. The Bible says the scripture for seeing, somebody shout for seeing. Watch this, he's getting ready to quote. Genesis 12, 3, the scripture for seeing that God would do what? Somebody ought to get happy over that when you read it. For seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by what? Not by perfection, but by what? So since God foresaw that, the scripture, the Old Testament writings uh, reveal, he preached the gospel beforehand to who? Isn't that good? He preached the good news to Abraham saying what? All the nations of the earth. You see that verse? This comes straight out of Genesis 12, 3. What are you saying tonight, Brother Jones? That I love the fact that we can teach tonight that God is a promise keeper. Has God kept any promises for you in your life? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God will provide because he is Jehovah Jireh. 
How do you know that? Because when on Mount Moriah, when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, let me tell you how much faith Abraham had. Abraham took Isaac and said, let's go. Now, what you don't remember sometimes is what I'm getting ready to tell you. I'm going to tell you why he had all the confidence. Because Abraham believed in the word of God. This is why Abraham could sacrifice his son Isaac. Why? Because he did what? He. Come on, church. What did he do? He. When God told him that in your seed, all the nations of the earth have been blessed, will be blessed. God knew Abraham knew that God would come through on his promise. So if he had to sacrifice his son, then he had to believe that some kind of way God had the power to resurrect him because God told me that in my seed. Come on, somebody. So if he hadn't had a seed yet and God says that through your seed, all the nations. So God, he had to believe that if he killed him. That God had the power, I hope y'all getting this tonight, that God had the power to raise him from the dead so he can use his seed to bless all the families of the earth. So I'm telling you tonight, the best thing that we could do is not hope in what we are able to do on our own. The best thing that you and I could do is find a biblical promise and believe in it. Find a biblical principle and believe in it. Let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel 16. God is a promise keeper. Now, now, so we've gotten that out of the way that he sent Samuel to Jesse the Bethlehemite. He says, watch this. Oh God, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Somebody shout selected. Let me read it one more time before I give you this next principle. This is my fourth principle and I'm done tonight. For I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Can we just read that together on three? One, two, three. For I have selected a king for myself among. Last time. For I have. Brother Wise, the word that got me was the word selected in the past tense. And the reason why that word got me was was because. Before God revealed who he had selected, he had already selected him. That blessed me because it helped me to see God has already selected you for some stuff that you don't even know. God had already selected who he wanted before he revealed who he selected. Now, they had a little trouble here because, because Samuel, the prophet, uh, had a little fear. He was a little nervous. Let's read the next verse. Verse two. Verse two. Notice the fear. But Samuel says, God told him, fill your horn with oil and do what? Go. But Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a helper with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, I'll just share this with you in um, Christian confidence that when I've taught this before, uh, back in Carolina, I had to kind of explain a couple things because in our African-American dialect and vernacular, um, if you, when you take the phrase, take a heifer with you, Some of my brothers and sisters think you're talking about a sister. <laughs> Say amen when you can. So I want you, everybody to be real quiet and just listen to what I'm getting ready to say. A heifer is a female cow that has not given birth. Female cow. Female cow, not female human. Amen. Because we like to use that term. And with a negative connotation, y'all smile tonight. Y'all know I'm telling you the truth. Praise God. Now, he says, take a heifer with you. Now, he didn't, he didn't tell him to lie. All he did was add 
to the list of things that God wanted to accomplish when he, when he sent Samuel to Jesse. Next verse. He said, I want you to say, take a heifer and sacrifice to the Lord. He says, you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice uh, and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. Fourth principle and we go on tonight. Fourth principle. Fourth principle. Let me make sure I get it right in my notes. Here it is. What God has for you is for you. Oh, church, I hope you're feeling this tonight. I want to say it again. These are principles, fundamental truths that serve as the foundation of a belief system or chain of reasoning. What God has for you is for you. Well, that's so good to me because the Bible teaches and tells us that when Jesse got to, excuse me, when Samuel got to a Bethlehem, the elders of the city came out and they wanted to know whether or not Samuel came in peace. And what you have to do is you have to look at the last chapter of uh, chapter 15, the last part of chapter 15 to know that the last part of chapter 15 of first Samuel teaches us that Samuel had just cut the uh, King Agag into pieces because Saul refused to exterminate him. So Agag was the uh, Amalekite king that God wanted to punish. So when the elders in Bethlehem heard that Samuel was coming into town, knowing that he had just cut somebody into pieces, they said, do you come in peace? <laughs> let, me show, let me show them in the Bible. Come on, Brother Randall. Verse 4. Let me just show it to him. Come on. So, so uh, thank you, Sister Mayhem, but I want to show everybody. Uh, so Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, do you come in peace? Next verse. He said, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Next verse. When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Next verse. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look. Now watch this. Notice his command. The Lord telling one of his great prophets. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance. Or at the height of his stature. Because I have rejected him. Watch this. Notice the powerful attribute of the almighty. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Aren't you glad that the Lord looks at my heart and I don't have to worry about what somebody else looks at about me? Amen, somebody. Because sometimes it's all about people's personal preferences. But Samuel thought, surely, because of his height, because of his stature, because of his good looks, that God chose Jesse's first son, Eliab. And then you know the story. Then uh, Abinadab came. God rejected him. The next son, third son came, Shema, and God had rejected him. And before long, all seven of Jesse's sons who were present at the sacrifice, who had been consecrated, um, passed by and God had rejected them all. That's why I wanted you to know what God has for you is for you. Because let me tell you some things that I learned. First of all, Jesse, oh, at, at this point, you know what the story says. It, it, the narrative says that uh, Samuel asked, is these, uh, are these all of your sons? And he, has, he says, no, I have the youngest one who was out there tending the sheep. And then he said, send for him because we got, we're not going to even sit down until you send for him. Now, what that showed me was it doesn't matter who shows up first to the party. I hope y'all know I'm trying to help you on tonight. It doesn't matter who applied first. It doesn't matter who got there before you did. It doesn't matter who know the manager. Come on, church. 
It does not matter who is most popular. If God has a blessing for you, can't nobody take what God has for you. Because whatever God has for you is for. So could you imagine what God is getting ready to do in this oil change exchange? God is getting ready to pull a young boy. Watch this. Who his own daddy did not deem him worthy to be with the other seven brothers. That's interesting to me. That if the prophet, the man of God, comes into town and says, um, I'm going to look through your sons, and he knows that, and he invited Jesse and his sons, that Jesse did not have the wherewithal to bring all of his sons, which tells me that even his daddy did not deem him worthy to be a part of what God was getting ready to do. And it could have been because he was the youngest and the least expected. But what he did not know is that God wanted the one that was being faithful to his earthly father. Because if you are faithful to your earthly father's assignment, God can deem you worthy to be faithful with your eternal father's assignment. And David was doing what I call making some, having some pasture experiences. Because David was faithful to his father's assignment, he was gaining some practice. He was preparing himself. And when all the seven brothers were invited, even though he was not invited, when God has a blessing for you, God will do it in front of the folk who didn't think you were worthy. So what God does is he anoints David in front of the daddy <laughs> and the seven brothers where he wasn't even invited to the sacrifice. Give God some glory that God knows how to do it for you. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, God, do it. Just do it, God. And I just want you to know that the principle is, now you're not David, I'm not David. This is a narrative. This happened thousands of years ago. What we're doing is pulling principles that are true everywhere, that if God has some for you, nobody can take it from you. And what we can learn is, even through Samuel, is that what you have to do is make sure that you follow the clear commandments that the Lord gives you and realize that you possess something of value that some people don't appreciate, but some people will. And realize that, uh, realize that God is a promise keeper. Somebody shout promise keeper. And it doesn't matter how long it's been since God gave the promise. By virtue of him being God, he will come through. Because the only thing that God cannot do is fail and lie. Anybody believe that tonight? The only thing God can't do is lie and fail. So I'm telling you. That if you have a promise, a biblical promise that God has given, it does not matter how long it's been. It does not matter how long uh, you have been through uh, adversity in your life. God will come through on his promises because God is a promise keeper. Now, this blessed my life because when I look at David, when we look at these principles, David was just being faithful. He didn't even know what was going on. But if I had time, I would tell you, let's go to verse number 18 real quick, real quick, real quick. Verse number 18. We'll go ahead and read the, the anointing and then we'll close. The Bible says, then one of the young men said, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Watch this. Who was a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, a handsome man. That's just genetics right there. I can't do nothing with that. Um, and the Lord is with him. I'm telling you. That when God sent, gave word to Samuel to send for David, what blessed my life was God will send somebody to come and get you when there's something that he wants you to do. I wish I can give God some praise with my church family tonight. Thank you, Jehovah. So I'm telling you that if you have prepared yourself if you pay attention to details, 
If you believe in doing it right and honoring God and doing the assignment that God has given you to the best of your ability, somebody will take notice of you. And you don't have to put all that stuff out there. Somebody will send for you to come and get you so that you can do what God has called you to do. Now, I want you to know how important this is, beloved, because what we find out through David is this powerful principle that, that, that it doesn't matter who wants it more. It does not matter who will do anything to get it. Anybody ever tried to get in front of you and compete with you on some stuff? And you're like, man, I'm, I'm not even in line right now. You can just go if you just want it that bad. But nobody can take what God has for you. And whatever God got for me, I want it. Somebody just shout, I want it, 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 I want it. I just want, listen, I don't want what God has for you. I just want, come on somebody, what God has for me. Because whatever God got for me, nobody can take it away from me. That's, that's all I got tonight. What questions do you have? What questions do you have tonight? The fourth one, and thank you so much. Uh, the fourth one was um, what God has for you is for you. Sure, sure. The first principle we learned tonight from the first few verses of 1 Samuel 16 was number one, follow the clear commandments God gives you. That clear commandment to which I'm referring to, God told Samuel to fill your horn with oil and do what? And go. In other words, don't stay grieving and mourning over what God rejected because God can send you on the journey from what he rejected to what he selected. If you follow his clear what? His clear commandments. So I'm telling you that the, the principle that I, I can also elongate and give you is, is that you could sit there and be depressed and whine and complain and hate. And, and you can lose time and energy and effort and money and potential over your life where you can just figure out what does God want me to do and be like Nike and just do it. The quickest way to get a blessing is do what God tell you to do. And if you were to look over your day to day, here's what you'll find. There's some commandments that you could have done, but you didn't. And like any good parent, God cannot reward disobedience. He punishes it. So no matter how good you have been, God has to take away something from, from you if you don't do what his clear commandments say. Okay? God has some clear command. When you say clear, that means that God did not make these commandments so difficult that you can understand them. Right? He wouldn't give us one Bible uh, for the entire humanity and then make it so difficult where nobody could understand it and then send us to hell for not being able to understand. So God didn't make the Bible hard. Uh, sometimes we make it hard. Number two, um, you possess, this is a principle, you possess something of value that someone else will appreciate. There's something that you possess. Remember, he's soaking over what God rejected and mourning, but he still had a horn. So he had something of value that David was getting ready to appreciate that Saul didn't. That's what I call the first oil change. Principle number three. Uh, and one more and we're done is God is a promise keeper because I gave you some details on who God sent him to, Jesse the Bethlehemite, because God was keeping a promise that he had gave, given Abram, whose name he changed to Abraham, through Jesse, his descendant, and subsequently through Jesse, then David. And number four was whatever God has for you is for you. Let's go ahead and read uh, verse number uh, 12, I believe. Let's go ahead and read that. First Samuel 16, 12. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the, just remind me of myself, y'all. Um, um, <laughs> I thought I was just reading something that my wife sent me. Praise God. I'm sorry. This is the Bible. Somebody shot this the Bible. I'm sorry. Uh, just joking, y'all. Just joking. Let's have some fun every now and then. Can we just have a little, a little levity is good for the soul every now and then. Come on, somebody. All right. And the Lord said, anoint, arise, anoint him for this. Samuel. 
anoint him, um, ceremonially anointed him. In other words, anointing is when God um, anoints you or sets you aside for a particular assignment. Everybody shout assignment. Just because you have a gift don't mean that you can do anything you want to do. So anointing does not give you a free pass to do what you want to do. The mere fact that God says you are anointed, he anoints you for an assignment. So we are anointed. Jesus is the anointed. Y'all got that? So when we say he is the Messiah, that comes from uh, the Hebraic term Mishnah, or the Greek term would be Christos, which means that he's the anointed one. He's the one. Everybody shout the one. Beloved, he is the one that God selected for the assignment that only he could fulfill because he is the only one that could live perfect. Is that right? He's the only one that could die for the sins of humanity in his own perfection. And that's what Jesus Christ did for us. Next verse. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. Watch this. This is the part I like in the midst of his brothers. In front of the people who got a chance to walk by the prophet. And got rejected. Nobody thought to ask, well, okay, where, where's, where's David at? Anybody seen David? Nobody thought about David, not even his daddy. So watch this. Here's the, what I learned. Uh, the people who gave you a public crucifixion, God will allow their punishment to be your public resurrection. God Almighty. Lord, have mercy. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. What questions do you have tonight? We'll pick up next week that the Lord says the same. I just want to give you these principles. And it's hard to get out of first Samuel. And I'm basically what I'm doing, just to remind you, I'm teaching every book of the Bible. I'm teaching the broad context and certain narrow context that are fruitful for our congregation because I don't believe that you we should tell our churches to read the Bible and never tell our churches on how to read the Bible because you can really develop some bad uh, uh, practices. Uh, you can actually take a text that does not apply to you and think that it does and think that you have what those people in the Bible have when, when you don't. That's why I'm very particular on telling you what is a principle that we can extract, extract, but telling you this was not written to us. This was written to, you know, uh, certain people during a certain time, during a certain season in a certain uh, Near Eastern culture that is different from our Westernized culture. So we have to study languages, linguistics, syntax. We have to study uh, what the text teaches in terms of its original context. You cannot make a text uh, mean what it never meant. But if you don't know some exegetical or hermeneutical practices on how to read the Bible, then you can think that everything is meant for you every time you read the Bible. And that's certainly not the case. Some of our religious neighbors have made what we call anachronistic arguments, which means that they take something that happened in one particular time and apply it to a time currently that is not applicable for them. And then they can come up with biblical error because they don't know how to read the Bible and they don't know how to principalize um, things that are for us. What questions do you have? Go ahead, sis. You go over like okay so okay so i know that uh jesse is abraham's descendant but can you go over the like who you said samuel anointed Saul? like who like can you go over that like who anointed who oh okay so um the names i kind of got yeah so samuel anointed saul um i think that's first samuel chapter 13 i'm gonna tell you like the old preacher used to say they wouldn't give you the exact verses if you just read the bible you'll run into it uh, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. 
And when they couldn't remember the verse, they say, it's in there somewhere. Amen. Amen. No, I ain't going to do you like the old preachers. Amen. Uh, but I know it's in chapter 13, I believe it was. Um, so Samuel anointed Saul. I would, I would honestly really say read uh, 1 Samuel 8, chapter 8, all the way to at least 13. And I think you can pick that up. So, so your first question is, who anointed who? Samuel anointed Saul. And then God rejected Saul as being king over Israel. And God told Samuel to fill up your horn with oil and go. And I have selected a king for myself uh, among his brothers. So then uh, God used Samuel to anoint David as the next king. So two, two, um, two anointings. I call that an oil change. Yeah, first oil change in the Bible. Any other questions tonight? Anybody getting anything good from these uh, principles? Is it blessing your life? Can I just tell you something real quick? This, this is this is you know I I, I kind of thrive on spontaneity. Um, I've been seeing this fly since I've been up here teaching y'all. Anybody been seeing this fly? About three years ago, brother Wise, I was you know I like to sit down with the church before I get up and preach. So you you most of the time I just be sitting down before I get up right before I got to preach. So I like to sit with y'all. So um, about three years ago, um, man, I was. I was sitting there on the front row getting ready to preach and a horse fly <clears throat> was buzzing all around our church on a Sunday morning. You know, the devil will send something to try to distract you all the time. Right. And it's, it just kept by my ear and all around y'all. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I watched him. Anybody just watch these flies, Sister Dorsey? You just be watching them, right? And all of a sudden, he, he flew all around the building, upsetting everybody. And all of a sudden, he flew back on the pulpit, and he went to the cross, and he just landed on the cross. And I said to myself, if a horse fly got enough to get to the cross, shouldn't the church fence, come on, somebody, get me to the cross? I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart, Omari. So to that end, if you're here tonight and you have not gotten to the cross, which we mean by believing in Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross and what that meant for the atonement of our sins, you need to appreciate that Jesus hung on the cross, died on the cross, was taken down from the cross, put in an empty tomb, but in three days God raised him from the dead, never to die again. You must believe that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with all of your heart, because it's, you're going to appreciate that one day, because everybody in here is going to have to stand before the judgment bar of God one day. And all the times where we didn't pay attention and we didn't take it seriously, and we think, oh, oh, because I keep hearing that over and over and over again, don't you ever take that position. Always have a level of humility in your spirit about what you hear in terms of Jesus to know that God is doing something for me that I can't even fully comprehend and understand. But what I can understand, I'm going to believe it. Somebody shall believe it. I just believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and I don't take it for granted. Got a call today that a young man who uh, follows, he's part of the Newburgh Nation, um, he, um, he died today. He, he lives, I don't even know where he lives, he lives somewhere in Kentucky. Um, Caucasian gentlemen have come several times here, but he's a, he's a huge Brian C. Jones supporter, man. He just <clears throat> supports us online. I found out he died, I don't even know his full name, um, but I want to pray for his family on tonight. And he was just on praying with the preacher with us on Friday. <clears throat> if, if, if you're on praying with the preacher with me, his name is like Deshaun Acre, some something like that. Um, Brother Sanders, you will remember him when he came last year um, and talked to us. But he passed away today suddenly. And I want to pray for his family. He was a great supporter of the Newburgh Church and a part of the Newburgh nation. So I want to pray for him. Said all that to say is sometimes death um, happens with swift transition. Um, it's shocking. It's, it's, it's hurtful that at one moment they're here 
and the next moment they're gone. And if they didn't take the Lord seriously, you just don't know uh, where death is. And to that end, death should be a reality that we need to take Christ and his church seriously. Because the only way to prepare for it um, is to be right with the Lord. You got to be right with Jesus so that when that comes, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, we'll we'll be sad. Yeah, we'll cry. Yeah, we'll be hurt. Yeah, we'll probably have to go to some kind of counseling. But the only thing that can give us solace is the fact that we know that person was faithful to Jesus Christ. So if you're here tonight and you're not prepared for the afterlife and you're not prepared for what's going to happen when God sends Jesus to come back for his church. Well, what you need to do tonight is make up your mind. You know what? I want to be prepared. I want to uh, be in right relationship with God. You do that by believing in the death, burial, resurrection, repenting of your sins. Make up your mind that I want to spend the rest of my life doing all the good that I can do. I've done enough bad before in my life. Amen. I want to do all the good that I can do. Confess Jesus as being the son of the living God and be just like Juliana. Praise God. Y'all give God glory for Juliana. <laughs> She made up her mind. She said, I'm going to do it today. And she was baptized for the remission of her sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, like all of us have. But if you have not done that, you have not even started your journey with Jesus. So I want you to do that tonight. If you need to do that, we want you to do it in a visible way. Oh, could you just come and give us a verse of something, anything you got right now? And um, this is just a time to reflect. And this is a time to say, you know what? I want to just think about Jesus and come on up. Oh, and um, we just want to give our life to Jesus. If you haven't done that, if you're online, please contact us. I really love the Lord. I, I really love the Lord and sing you. You don't know what he's done for me. He gave me the victory. I love him. I love him. I, I really love the Lord and sing you don't know what he's done for me he gave me the victory i love him i love him i, I love the lord and sing you Know what he's done for me. He gave me the victory. I love him. I love him. I really love the Lord. Let us pray. Dear, we come before you today as a congregation and as a family, first and foremost, giving you thanks and praise for everything that you've done for us so far, Lord. All the blessings and the grace that you've given us, Lord, we want to say thank you. Lord, we ask you to watch over our minds. You ask that you watch over our spirits and our footsteps as we way through this land, Lord, that we ask that you bless us and keep us and uh, hold us until we come back appointed in the, again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.